How many of you remember Brother August Twelfth? A few of you. I never can honestly say I ever remember meeting him because he passed away not too many years after I was born. You read his book, a little tiny book he wrote. He said something in there that I honestly can't say I've got myself to that point, but I thought it was really good. You know, with his speech impediment, speaking in front of people is not something he wanted to do, but after he got saved, he determined that he was going to make sure he testified. And every testimony service, he stood up and stuttered out the words, I'm glad I'm saved, and sat down. And he said what that did for him is when he had something to testify about, other than that, he was in the habit of already testifying. And I just, it struck me, you know, how simple that is to say and how I never get up and just say it. But yet he made it a point to where he would, you know, and after that, God called him to preach. He got to where he could stand up and stutter in front of everyone. And so he, why not do it from the pulpit? And as you know, God used him greatly. Anyway, that's not what I really was going to talk about tonight, but it fits in. I have <clears throat> tonight, our scripture reading will be found in the Matthew in chapter nine. If I can brag for just a second, we had a a readathon with a Bible readathon yesterday with the teens, and because we are trying to take our teen church at there in Independence to sight and sound to see Jesus on Good Friday. Well, 31 tickets cost some money, um, <clears throat> as you can imagine, and that's that's how many tickets we have already. And so we were doing a fundraiser. And my children are going because we're going and we're, we're going to take them, even though they're not teens, we're going to take them. And so Andrea felt that they should be part of the readathon, even though they're not teens, you know, they're going on the trip. And so, 
And Daryl Clifton, was a, this was his idea of a way to raise some money. And so what you could do is you could sponsor five cents, 10 cents, 25 cents per chapter read. And so trying to get the teens to read their Bibles. And so Daryl said, what we should do is read the Gospels. Because you're going to go see Jesus, you need to read the, you know, start reading the bibliography of Jesus. So I was pretty proud. My little girl got nine chapters read on her own. And Josh got the whole book of Matthew read in that time. I was pretty proud of him. I, was, I honestly wasn't there. I was trying to work on a sermon and in a meeting with Brother Albert most of the time. And, and there's another pastor there, and he had his notebook because us adults, our reading didn't count. So the, um, I said, you working on a sermon? And he said, got a couple of them. You know, he was studying away. But I just, chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9, made, well, maybe think of it was, that's how far my daughter got through on her reading that time. I hope you found it. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. I'll, I'll let you re remain seated. That's fine. Verse 35 through 38. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And he saith unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. I have a question tonight. That is the question. Are you, that is, am I available? In other words, am I, are you willing to be used? J. Hudson Taylor made this statement. I used to ask God if he would come and help me. Then I asked if I could come and help him. Finally, I ended by asking God to do his own work through me. A scripture verse that you probably know is Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. It says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. The passage of scripture that I read tonight and that verse from Mark, I believe, apply to you and I as disciples of Christ. This was just not said to the 12 or the 11 at that point in chapter 16 of Mark. It wasn't just for those 11 that walked with him on earth. It is for all disciples, all followers of Christ. We are his laborers and we are commanded to go. You know, but there are many reasons <clears throat> that are used not to go. M reasons that maybe you or I give to say we're not available. And although I will say I believe some of these reasons seem very plausible, they do not disqualify us from doing God's work. I'd like to look at a few of them tonight and try to keep it halfway brief. Now, some of I'm not trying to point fingers, but due to the congregation tonight, this first one may seem like I'm pointing a finger. Maybe we say we're not <clears throat> available. <clears throat> Excuse me. We cannot go due to our age. You know, there's those that either say they're either too old or too young to do God's work. You know, Zachariah said he and Elizabeth were too old. He did. And then for the next nine months, he couldn't talk. That would be a blow to me. <laughs> I think that would be one of the worst things. But he said they're too old. That's pretty much what he was saying. God said, I'll show you. Now, that's my words. God didn't say it that way. Sarah thought her and Abraham were too old. And honestly, looking at them, medically speaking, they were too old. And yet God used them. You know... A child was crucial to Jesus' ministry. John chapter 6, verses 5 through 10, tell us the story of the feeding of the 5,000 men besides the women and children. Verse 9 says, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? A lad. He wasn't even old enough yet to be counted a man. He was under the age of 13. We don't know how old he was. It was a boy. And yet... His willingness to be used 
allowed the dependent upon how you rate miracles, but according to the people, the single great, greatest miracle that Jesus had done up to that point by far to happen. That is the miracle that propelled Jesus into the spotlight where they wanted to make him king, the feeding of the 5,000. And who made it possible? A child who was willing to be used by Jesus. I do not believe God is bothered by how old or how young you are. He just wants you to be available. Now, some people say, well, you know, my physique does not allow me to be available. Yeah, I have this problem or that problem, this physical issue, that physical issue, this limitation, that limitation. You know, it seems the Apostle Paul, from all that we can gather, he had bad eyesight. And yet he wrote prolifically. God used him greatly. God called King Saul, who was extremely tall. 1 Samuel 9, 2, the third part of the verse tells us he was from his shoulders upward higher than any of the people. Saul stuck out like a sore thumb. You know, some people look at it, I looked at it as a child, like, oh, well, God, of course, God wanted the king to be the one that everyone noticed. But it seemed like Saul was pretty self-conscious. And he went and hid amongst the baggage, amongst the stuff. You know, the Bible does use that word stuff, anyhow, in the King James Version. So stuff's legal for those that don't like that word. <laughs> he did. He stuck out. He was, he was a giant compared to everyone else. And God called him. God had a plan for him. Now Saul may have messed it up, but God wanted to use him. You know, David was selected as king, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 4 through 12. And I like this verse 7. It's, but God is speaking to Samuel, the prophet, and says, Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. Talking about David's older brother. He is selected Saul as king, who's this tall guy. And then God says, don't look at his face. Don't look at how tall he is. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. God says it doesn't matter if he's good looking or if he's tall. That's not what I'm looking at. I'm looking in here. I love that God says that because just a couple verses later, in verse 12, it says this. And Jesse sent and brought David in. Now he was ruddy and of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. David was good looking. God just said, don't look at his face. That's not how I'm judging him. It just so happens that the guy who was beautiful inside happened to be beautiful outside. And God said, arise and anoint him as king. God just let the prophet know, I'm not going to be picking my king because of how he looks. He may look good, but that has nothing to do with it. I'm looking at the inside. I don't think David fully understood all of what this meant at that point in time. He was a good-looking shepherd boy who, was a, who could play an instrument and use a sling. Probably about like most of the other shepherd boys. They, they could use slings. That's what they used. If you start researching the culture and the time, and, and there was people, that, that's what they did. They, they practiced with them. It was a defense. It was a means of hunting. Shepherds at times had extra time on their hands. They could practice that. They could practice playing their instrument. It soothed the sheep. There may have been a lot of shepherd boys in David's time that were good with their slings and good with their instrument and might have been good looking. But God wasn't concerned about all that. He wanted what was in here. The one who was willing to follow him. The one that was willing to do what he wanted. God's not bothered by your physique. He just wants you to be available. You know, God's not concerned with your social standing either. Luke 5, 27 through 32 tells us the story of a publican named Levi who invites Jesus over for a meal and invites all of his friends. And verse 30 of that story says, But the scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering unto them, said this, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners 
to repentance. God used Levi, who was considered to be low on the totem pole, so to speak. He was a publican who was only one step up from the bottom. The bottom was sinner. The next step up was publican. And that was Levi. He was at almost at the bottom within the Jewish culture. He's a Jewish man who works for the Roman government, accepting taxes for the Romans, taxing his own people. I don't think people like tax collectors still to this day. And God chose someone low on the social standing of the day, really low on the totem pole, and asked him to be one of his main 12. God's not bothered by social status. He just wants you to be available. God's not concerned with your wealth or your lack thereof. Matthew 17, 24 through 27 is a little story that tells us that Peter went fishing in order to pay his and Jesus' taxes. Verse 27, Jesus says to Peter, Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast in a hook and take up the fish that cometh first up. And when thou openest his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. Take that and give unto them for me and thee. It doesn't sound like Peter and Jesus had enough money to pay the taxes. You know, Peter wasn't rich. Peter had left his job to follow Christ. I believe that God uses both the poor and the rich. Have you all ever read the story of R.G. Letourneau at all? I have heard many times, you know, how much R.G. Letourneau gave. And so I was reading his book one day, and it started surprising me. If you haven't read the story, R.G. Letourneau built the company now that is known as Komatsu. That's who bought him out. The world's largest earth-moving equipment was built by Letourneau. He's the one that figured out how to get a truck to haul a heavier payload than what the truck weighed empty. It had never been done before him. The trucks always weighed more than the payload they could handle. All these big massive earth moving equipment he he designed he built he was a genius god gave him all this ability and the ability to make money and so he gave money to god and i've always heard laterno gave god 90 percent of all he made it and then i started reading no that's not true when laterno decided to make god his business partner he split the business 50 50 and 50 percent of what came in went to god never went to the laterno equipment company the other 50%, he tithed his 10% off of, and God blessed him, so he tithed more and more until he was tithing 90% of his 50%. 50% of it never once went to him. That just amazed me. This guy who was a, made millions, God wasn't worried about his wealth. He knew that Laterno could handle it. And what Letourneau did, he turned around and used it for God. I don't remember if I told the story here or not of the, of the man that got saved and went to his pastor and said, I want to preach. And the pastor very wisely realized that this man was not a preacher. He was in the Southern Baptist Church, and he told the man, I don't think God's calling you to preach. You're a businessman. God gave you the gift of making money. And the businessman had to admit the man was right, the, his pastor was right. He did not have the ability, the gifts of being a preacher, but he had the ability to make money. This was as a few years ago when I was talking to one of my friends, and he said up to that point that man had donated $77 million to God's work. He personally, his company was personally running orphanages, supporting missionaries totally on their own. But you know what? God can call the poor fisherman who doesn't even have enough money to pay his own taxes, or he can call the wealthy businessman. God's not concerned about their wealth. He just wants you to be available. God's not concerned about your education or your training. Matthew 4, 17 through 22 tells the story of Jesus calling his first four disciples. Jumping in at verse 18, and Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Jump down to verse 21. And going on from thence, he saw two other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. God called four fishermen to be his first disciples, four common, hardworking, everyday people. 
uneducated. How do I know? Jump all the way to the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 13. It says, and when they saw, this is the, this is the people, saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Jesus called unlearned and ignorant men. They would have had the minimal schooling available. Fishing was the family business. We see in the James and John, it tells us that. They were working with their father, mending nets. I believe they were hardworking guys. They knew how to work. But education, no, nah, wasn't there. Training, experience, well, if it was mending nets or steering a boat or something to do with fishing on the Sea of Galilee, yes. Outside of that, probably not. In fact, it seems to me that James and John were more, no more than teenagers, actually, when they were called, once it's studied out, that they were young. And Jesus called them. But I love that. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. God wasn't concerned about their lack of education, their lack of training. They hadn't attended Bible college. They didn't have years of experience under someone who knew what they was doing, trying to give them pointers. He called them, they went, and he used them. I don't believe God is bothered by our lack of education or excellence, whether we're gifted or well-trained. He just wants us to be available. I have a couple points to ponder. Is it possible to make ourselves so we're not available? I heard of a young man who was, when he graduated seminary, he had done his, he has his, I believe he just, I don't know if he had his doctorate in divinity or just his master's, seemed to be a powerful preacher, good. High hopes for him. But there was a problem. He had so much debt, he, couldn't, he wouldn't go to a church to pastor unless they could offer him six figures a year in order to pay his debt. He was making himself unavailable for what God wanted him to do. You know, what if God had this, this idea for this, what God wanted was for this young man who had so much potential to go to some place that couldn't hardly afford to pay him a salary at all. And he had to work, you know, full time in order to pay his bills and then preach on top of that. He couldn't do it. They said his options were limited. I thought, yeah, that would be very limiting. I don't see, I don't know too many churches that, sure, we can do that. You know, we can tie ourselves down with our possessions to where it makes it really hard for us to be available. And I'm talking to myself here. It's something I talked with my wife when we were starting the tree service I said, you know, we don't know where God's going to call us to go. We know he's calling us to start this tree service, so we will. I said, I'm okay with doing that, though, because it's mobile. I can pack everything up on trailers or whatever and move it. I'm not tied down. I don't want to get myself so tied down with my possessions that if God calls me to up and move somewhere that I can't do it. I want to make sure I'm available to what he wants when he wants just a couple little things I thought I'd mention on availability. We need to make sure we make it so we are available. We may have all of our excuses why we can't and all that, but the truth comes down to it. If we are a disciple, a follower of Christ, we better be available. Some more points to ponder. The scripture says, send forth laborers. You know, it does not say anything other than that. No specifics, not a certain kind, you know, not, edu not that they had to have a certain education as I talked about or this or that, just laborers. That's all kinds. That's equipment operators, CDL drivers, mechanics, office managers, waitresses, sales representatives, factory workers, stay-at-home moms, whatever. That's anyone and everyone that God is calling for. Because we all have different skills, we all have different talents, we all have different abilities, different personalities, and we are all needed to make the harvest happen. The harvest is ripe, it's ready. God is calling us where we are at today, whatever stage of life that is, to do what he wants us to do. 
with our skill set that we have, how either great or small that is. For me, one of the best illustrations of this is someone that you all don't know. She's gone to heaven now, and I had the privilege of knowing for a few years, and that's my mother-in-law. Brief history. Mom had a hard life growing up. She got married, had Andrea. 11 months later, her husband was killed. She spent the rest of her life single. And she didn't want to leave Andrea with a babysitter. So she took jobs that allowed her to either take Andrea with her or do the jobs at home, which meant she cleaned houses for people. She took in other people's ironing and iron clothes, whatever it took. Mom had some dreams and things that she had wanted to do, but she had a responsibility of raising her daughter and she took that seriously. Mom was not what I would call a people person. She had a way of speaking. You would love to hurt, hurt her speak though. She was funny. She could be ornery, but she wasn't that just you know, she wasn't one to just be f talking with people. She'd come into church, sat down, not talk to anyone. And I'm not joking. They said amen. And she was out the back door and into her vehicle. That was just her. She wasn't a big people person. Andrea was in school and mom got, was able to get a job that allowed her to work the same hours. And she worked for years as a housekeeper for a large nursing home. She ran a vacuum. She changed the bedding. She dusted. You know what housekeepers do. They keep everything running, keep it clean. And she did it for years. That's mom's resume. At age 60, she packed her stuff up, sold off most, her, sold a lot of things and headed to Africa because God called her to be a missionary. Now, what skill set did she have to take? She wasn't a big people person. She only knew English. She had a GED for an education. She knew how to cook. She knew how to clean, iron, and God calls her to go to Africa at age 60. God knew exactly what he was doing. See, because my mother-in-law said she was available. And there was a call for a missionary help for a single missionary woman in Africa who was a nurse and a preacher and was so busy she could not keep up with everything. She couldn't keep up with the cooking. She couldn't keep up with the cleaning. She, couldn't, she needed a companion. And guess what? My mother-in-law realized she fit all those things. She had nothing holding her back. Her only child is, is Andrea. She has grandchildren. She loved them, but she knew she loved God more. She wanted to serve him, and she went. I've heard the missionary that she went to be with speak, and that woman said if Sharon had not came, that she would have been curled up in a corner, going blah, 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 because she would have lost her mind. She could not keep up with everything. She wasn't eating well because she didn't have time to cook. She was delivering babies, and she was doing this and that. My mother-in-law <clears throat> made her meals. She did the laundry, she cleaned the place, she kept up with things, and she went with the woman when she needed someone to go with her. My mother-in-law never learned the language, but the people that she was with loved her. To look at pictures, it was interesting. I couldn't do it. Their, their pews were made out of dirt. I'm not joking, dirt mounds, formed really nicely. And there would be one plastic chair in the church, and that was for Sharon. And they put it by the door so she could get airflow because they knew she ran hot. I'm not joking. The, a picture of the church, there'd be a chair beside the door. That's for Sharon. Debbie preached. Sharon got to sit in the back right where there was airflow. They loved her. There's a baby over there that we have never met named Sharon, named after my mother-in-law. She wasn't educated. She didn't have this amazing singing voice. She wasn't a big people person, but you know that worked out great because Debbie wasn't there all day. She just needed some companionship when she was home. Well, my mom and my mother-in-law could keep a conversation going for that amount of time. She loved it. God knew exactly what he was doing. He called someone 
who seemed to be too old to go to the mission field. Debbie was in her 40s. She needed a mother to, in many ways, she said. And she said, Sharon is exactly what I needed. She was old enough that Debbie felt that it was like mom where she could just pour her heart out to and someone to take care of her. God knew exactly what he was doing. You know, it may have not made sense to anyone else. Who wants to, who's going to send a 60-year-old single lady with no experience, no training, no qualification whatsoever to the mission field? A person who, if you ask my wife, couldn't ever figure out how to get from home to camp meeting on her own without my wife giving her directions. And here she has, to, she, she flies around the world by herself, changing planes and airports and all these different countries and all that. My wife goes, how's she going to do it? It's a two hour drive to camp meeting and every year. I had to explain to her how to get there. And my mother-in-law never had one problem over there. God knew what he was doing. God uses what you have to fill a need which you never could have filled. God uses where you are to take you to where you never could have gone. God uses what you sorry, God uses what you can do to accomplish what you never could have done. God uses who you are to let you become who you never could have been. I don't think we ever run out of being able to be used by God. Brother Lloyd DeVault, I would love to listen to him preach, and I hated when he got older to where he quit preaching. You know, now he's in the assisted living. It's like, well, you know, he's probably done about everything he can for God. No. He affects so many nurses in there. There are nurses that they won't leave his room till he quotes a certain amount of scripture to them. He's had the chance to reach how many? John 4, 35 says, Say not ye, yet there are four months, and then cometh the harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. The harvest is ready. The question is, am I, are you available?